So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Pat W9JI. Welcome to the October meeting of the Ozaki Radio Club. And um, tonight we have a guest speaker, John W6NBC. He's going to talk to us about foil tape antennas, which is an interesting topic, I think. And um, John is a native of Los Angeles and a longtime ham licensed in uh, 1965 and an extra since 1972. And John has a degree in physics and is retired from a career in TV broadcast, television engineering, and as an instructor. And has also been published in QST a number of times. So. Um, and some of John's other interests include uh, steam railroading, the pipe organ, and sushi. And John, if you like sushi, you should be glad you do not live in Fredonia, Wisconsin, because it is not a common item here. And uh, with that, we'll turn it over to John. Practical metal foil tape antennas. This started as just a little fun and game experiment for me. But after time, I was so enamored with the idea uh, as being non, not a very typical ham uh, activity and made a presentation at the QSO Today Ham Expo on 21. I'm going to speak again the next one coming up. And, uh, and this particular topic has been extremely popular. I've got also still several bookings more to uh, talk about it to other clubs. So uh, it, it, I was very surprised. Because generally speaking, hams tend to consider only these visible building materials for, uh, for their uh, building antennas. Uh, obviously, uh, copper wire up at the top for dipoles and aluminum tubing probably lead the list. But copper tubing is still quite popular, particularly if you've built and who hasn't one of the ever present two meter J poles. <laughs> and of course, stainless steel rod, which is used for whips and stingers and other things like that. But these two materials here <coughs> are very versatile building materials. And we still got a couple of uh, attendees with their audio not muted. Uh, so I'm hearing some background noise. Anyway, these two materials right here, very useful, I have come to realize, uh, for producing antennas, as opposed to aluminum tubing or all those other materials. And, uh, it, and it offers some new areas of, of development that have really never been made, to, made available. This uh, topic, copper on the left and aluminum tape on the right, very commonly found on the internet. You can find copper tape at garden stores as snail tape to keep snails out of your planters. And aluminum tape, of course, you can find it at most uh, hardware stores used for taping up air conditioning ducts. And it comes in a variety of widths from very narrow up to quite wide. Well, here are some foil tape antennas just to open up the uh, discussion that I first ran into, and it's what got me into foil tape antennas when I developed the slot antenna material that I've been presenting quite a bit. And I wrote the slot antenna book, which you can obtain there on Amazon Kindle uh, using the QR code or just going to a Amazon and searching for slot antennas for ham radio. Been quite popular and uh, talks all about uh, some of the various things. But you see me there in the upper left experimenting with my early, one of my early slots, some aluminum tape on cardboard. You see a fun one that I did in the back window of my truck and one that's you know, on a patio sliding door window. These are slot antennas uh, made with copper, with, with uh, aluminum foil tape. Could have been done with copper too. Particularly though, what really got me interested in metal foil tape antennas was the article I ran back here in October 2020 QST, this little antenna, which got a lot of reader 
mail came in on this one, uh, making a little helically continuously loaded two meter dipole to compete with the ever present ugly J pole that everybody builds. This little antenna has pretty much the same performance as a J pole, and yet it's only 40% as tall, made with some one inch copper tape wrapped on some inch and a quarter PVC tubing. It's only 18 inches tall. I ask you, which one is your neighbor going to notice? Here's some other fun uh, uh, foil antennas, things I'm playing with. On the left is one that uh, my neighbors like because of Snoopy and Woodstock on the top. It's a real birdhouse up there. They have no idea that uh, that birdhouse uh, is sitting on top of a fully functional, no radial, vertical six meter helical antenna made with aluminum foil tape. In the middle is a nice little uh, very XYL friendly two meter antenna. Oh yes, that's a two meter antenna. It's a helical, it's a helically continuously loaded two meter helix. And it's a lot more attractive than that ugly J pole you tried to hide in the corner when you wanted to sit in your easy chair and talk to your buddies on your handy talking and not get a report of, hey, get a new radio. And on the right is one I'll show you a little more of. It's a it's using copper foil tape on a cart, big cardboard tube that you can buy at most building builder stores for pouring concrete posts. Here's the little planter antenna. It's done on a 10 inch glass planter, four inches in diameter, five inches in diameter. And you can see how the foil tape wraps around it and how the foil connect tape connects to it. I use brass washers soldered to the end of, of coax and then taped onto the surface of the of the foil with a Gorilla tape, works br brilliantly. And you see a little ballon there, uh, which you can put inside if you want. Here's an interesting use for the foil tape. I already showed you a picture of it, but here's a, some better pictures of it. This is this big cardboard tube up in your attic with a lot of turns of, of one inch copper tape on it. Up till now, uh, making big loading coils for the attic usually involved expensive coils, big expensive coils of copper tubing, which is quite expensive, much cheaper to do it this way. How do you attach to it? Well, you can see it there in the upper left with some magnets on the inside and a cup magnet on the outside. And it's tuned with that little rotating loop at the bottom. Here's the uh, antenna. Uh, shown schematically, you can see the 23 turn coil on the 12 by 48 inch copper foil tape tube, and it's got uh, some uh, end sections on it uh, to make it into a 40 meter attic dipole that's only 25 feet long, which will fit in a lot of attics, only 40% the length of a full size dipole. And there's another drawing of it at the bottom showing the two 10 foot end sections. You can put longer end sections on and get it even lower or shorter ones and get it higher. It's uh, an easy antenna to configure in your attic. Here's another use for copper foil tape. People sometimes like to just put them in their house, maybe up along the crown molding or stuck to the wall or along a door post or something. Very handy material for building dipoles inside. Here's an interesting way to do it. This is a rose trellis or two rose trellises. You probably recognize them, the kind you can buy at garden centers for out of plastic. They have one inch wide straps, perfect width, perfect width to put foil tape on the back where you can't see the hidden dipole. And I've got this one down to 40 meters and below quite easily on the back of this antenna, on the back of these two rose trellises. Tonight, though, I want to put emphasis, though, on building small HF tape helices or helixes, if you prefer that pronunciation. This was the two meter one that I showed you earlier, which got good email and you can see it. It's a it's a, a seven seven turn helix uh, center fed off center fed. No radials necessary uh, works just great has almost the gain of a J-pole, and yet is only uh, uh, 18 inches high. 
but I want to, a lot of people when they saw this article said, can you do this on HF? And the truth is, yes, you can. This was the beginning, my beginning though. If we're gonna go down lower in frequency though, we need some principles. So I've got a little tool bag here. We're gonna build a toolkit of foil tape antenna building principles, particularly foil tape helices or helix helixes wound on various tubings or other or other forms. We're going to deal with three concepts here, which are essential if you're going to build foil tape antennas. How much power will foil tape handle? I get that question often. We're also going to deal with skin effect. Most of you don't think too much about skin effect but it's a very present phenomenon in antennas. And it's particularly present in foil tape antennas, as we will see. Also, the third topic, we'll, the third principle we wanna deal with here is the efficiency of an antenna. Because what generally are you going to be doing with foil tape? You're gonna to try to make the antenna smaller than its full-size cousin, smaller than a full-size linear dipole. And what happens to the efficiency of an antenna when you make it smaller? This is what we're going to talk about here. All right, first of all, how much power will this thin foil tape handle? A lot of people are afraid of it, but don't be, as you will see. Here's how you determine how much power it will handle. A round conductor that has a circumference equal to the width of the tape and the same cross-sectional area handles just as much power as a round tubing will handle. Let me give you an example. If you work these numbers backwards and do a little math on it, you will see that a piece of 3 8 inch copper or aluminum tubing is the equivalent of power handling capacity of a one inch wide piece of foil tape, one and a half mil thick. That's the common width you'll find it on the internet. So you don't have to have any worry about this metal foil tape handling power. It'll handle fine the power that you want to throw at it. You might need to do a little calculating just to be sure it's wide enough, but it's easy to handle power with tape. Another side issue, and you notice there at the bottom, if any of you like to do NEC modeling, like with 4 next 2 or Easy Neck, uh, which is my favorite. I just love Easy Neck. It's the f best program for my computer I've ever obtained. But if, if you like to do NEC modeling, neck modeling of antennas, all you have to do is do this to your models. Make it out of a round conductor that has the equivalent circular or uh, circumference area of the of the round tubing, and it'll model just like it was flat foil. Or if you want, you can make wireframes uh, of, uh, of the antenna if you want to model the uh, foil antenna, but this works very well. Just make it, just make it have a, a piece of round, round conductor that has the same uh, width as the circumference of the round conductor. All right, enough said on that. So no worries about handling power. Skin effect. This is an interesting topic, particularly here with foil antennas. It applies to all antennas, but it's particularly important here. As you know, most hams know this, but if you're a new ham, you might this might be new to you. All conductors, if they're handling DC, the current flows uniformly throughout the conductor. So the whole conductor conducts DC current. But as soon as you go to alternating current, and especially to RF, which is just very high frequency alternating current, the current moves outward to the skin or the edge of the conductor. This is caused by the residual field uh, in the inside the conductor. Even though it's a conductor, it's not a perfect conductor, and it has some field still in it. So the current moves outward meaning that on AC conductors or RF conductors, only the outer skin of it is actually being used. The center of it is being wasted. And you can see the effect here on a round conductor and on a flat foil tape conductor. 
the center of both of those is not being used. So the efficiency of a conductor carrying AC is less than the efficiency of a conductor carrying DC. A DC conductor will carry more current for the same wire size. Also remember while we're here, a flat conductor has two surfaces where a round conductor has only one in respect to skin effect. Skin effect you might uh, you probably know about, but uh, you might not, might not know that even, at, even as low as power line frequency, 60 hertz or 50 hertz in Europe, that skin effect still has a noticeable effect. And so designers of high tension lines like this big, I think this is a 500,000 volt line, um, maybe less, I don't know. All of the conductors are doubled up. Notice how they're not singular conductors. They're made in a group of three or four conductors. This minimizes skin effect, even at 60 hertz. It's appreciable. I made a table here for you. You don't need to, uh, need to uh, write this all this down, but it shows you the depth of the skin, of the RF skin effect at various frequencies from 160 meters at the top to the 70 centimeters of the 440 megahertz band at the top, the common ham bands. There's the thickness of the skin. It's about, uh, you can see it's as thick as two and a half mils in aluminum tape on 160 meters, but drops down on 70 centimeters at the bottom to two tenths of a mil in aluminum and even one tenth of a mil, mil being a thousandth of an inch in copper. You need to pay attention to this and realize that if you buy tape though, that your skin thickness from this table needs to be, uh, needs, to, uh, needs to be the equivalent of the two depths on either side of the tape. So when, pay attention to that when you're buying the tape, that you get tape that's thick enough to handle the skin effect. I might just notice, pay attention to another skin effect problem here that some of you know well about, but others may not. Here's a loading coil that you might make on a piece of PVC uh, or fiberglass or whatever, such as you might have on the back of your, your, your car or your truck uh, for HF mobiling. This has got a lot of turns on it to make it into a loading coil. If you put the turns of a loading coil close together, you increase the skin effect because the, the residual field inside of those round turns not only push it to the outside, they push it away from the adjacent turn. This is called adjacent turn skin effect loss. You must pay attention to this when you're building foil tape antennas. It becomes quite critical. You also, if you've done much mobile or the designing of mobile antennas, no, you need to pay attention to it too on your mobile whip antennas. If you want to get rid of it, all of the adjacent turn skin effect in a coil, you've got to space the turns three to one to diameter. That you'll have no skin effect loss then uh, or adjacent turn skin effect loss. One to one is good enough, frankly, I found uh, spacing things one to one. So however wide you make the tape, it's best to try to space it at least the same width apart. All right, those are basic rules, which I think everybody can understand quite easily. Let's come to something that's a little more difficult because it'll run into uh, a concept that new hams especially, but even many older hams are not familiar with, an entity called radiation resistance. We'll get to that here in just a second. Antenna efficiency, what is it? Well, simply said, it's the power in an antenna that doesn't get lost in the antenna. All antennas lose some of the power you put into them. The efficiency of the antenna is the percentage that isn't lost. In other words, the percentage of the power you put into it that becomes radio waves, not the, not the power that you put into it that gets lost in other reasons, mainly heat. To understand efficiency in an antenna, which is very important in foil antennas, we need to look here at the equivalent circuit 
of all antennas. They're made up, all antennas are made up of these four basic entities. On the left, two called reactants, or inductive and capacitive reactants. We're familiar with these to most hams. You're familiar with them. This is what you tune in an antenna. On the right are two real resistances, just like you read with an ohmmeter. R sub C, that's called conductor resistance. And R sub R is called radiation resistance. Both of these are present in all antennas. I'll take a closer look at them here in a moment. But a basic point about all these four elements is the ones on the left, inductive reactants or the, the, the inductance of an antenna, and its, and, its, and its capacitance or its reactance, capacitive reactance, don't use power. Even though this is a series circuit and the transmitter's power flows through all four of these in series, X sub L or X sub C, the tuning elements in, a, in all antennas, don't use power. All they do is tune the antenna. They're what make a dipole uh, of a half wavelength long resonant. And, uh, but they don't use up any power, but they're present there in this series circuit in all antennas. It's the two on the right that use power, either for good purposes or for bad purposes. I made the bad one red and the good one green because there are good, good and bad. These two resistances in all antennas, foil antennas or copper tubing antennas or wire antennas, these two resistances in all antennas use part of the transmitter's power. And the efficiency is a ratio between the two of them. The better the good one, the higher the efficiency. The, the higher the bad one, the lower the efficiency. Well, most of you know what conductor resistance is. Simple. It's the kind of resistance you can read with an ohmmeter. I know a piece of aluminum tubing doesn't have a lot of resistance, but it has some real resistance. And it's that resistance, uh, that it's that conductor resistance that's the bad guy in antennas. It's what wastes the power in all antennas. And you got to keep the conductor resistance low if you want an efficient antenna. Here's the basic, here's the basic rule of thumb. Conductor resistance makes heat. R sub C conducts and makes heat. It's that demon heat flame up there. All any of the power that comes from your transmitter that 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 en engages the conductor resistance gets lost as heat. It's the radiation resistance that's present in all antennas, property of all antennas, R sub R, that makes the radio waves. It's the good guys. It's the green one here, not the red one. So realize these two entities that consume power in all antennas. There's a good one and a bad one. And efficiency is the ratio between these two, a ratio between, not the ratio. It's a complex ratio. Radiation resistance. So a lot of, to a lot of people, as symbolized here by Sherlock with his pipe, radiation resistance is a kind of a mystery. You may have heard the term, or you may not even have heard the term, but it's an important term for a ham to understand, particularly if you want to make small antennas. Now, here's, here's James Clark Maxwell, who wrote down the famous, these four famous par partial differential equations way back in the ending of the 19th century. I'm not going to go and try to go into these equations for you here. I just want to take one upshot of what these equations prove to the world of science. These equations prove to the world of science, first of all, that radio waves and light waves are the same thing. One's just higher frequency and they travel at the speed of light. That's not the important principle here. The important principle here is, as these equations definitely demonstrate, space is not nothing. You might think of empty space, a piece of space way beyond the galaxies and everything, just a piece of space. You might think that's nothing. That's just an empty, that's an empty nothing. No, it is not nothing. 
these four equations, Maxwell and Faraday and others of the brilliant pioneers of radio back in the early days in the 19th century, came to realize that space is just as real as anything else in space, the matter, the energy, uh, the time that's present in space. Space itself is real. If it weren't real, radio waves would not exist, and that's important. I want to give you a little analogy here. I love this little metaphor. I'm not returning to the luminiferous ether that a lot of scientists back in the 19th century thought surrounded all space, but I like the metaphor of it. And I think it helps explain what happens in an antenna better than anything I've ever seen. I call it, obviously, from this picture, the bowl of jello analogy. And I'm showing in this bowl of jello, sitting on top of the bowl of jello, an antenna or a piece of wire in this case. What happens in a bowl of jello if that finger moves in there and touches that wire and shakes it? What happens? Well, you see what happens here. Waves, ripples in the jello take place. Well, I like to imagine. It's just an imagination. It's just a metaphor, an analogy. I like to imagine that space, all of space, billions of light years out there, however big the space is, if it ha has any limits, is one great big blob of jello. And every antenna that exists in that blob of jello is stuck to it, is embedded in it, like a piece of pineapple in your jello salad. It's right in there. And what happens if you shake that antenna? How do we shake it? By putting electric currents in it, by putting RF into it. We vibrate the electrons, the copper, the copper atoms inside that antenna. And when we shake those copper electrons, it shakes the entirety of space because the entirety of space is an elastic solid. It's real. It's not nothing. That's very important. And this analogy to me makes radiation resistance real. Radiation resistance is a real resistance created in every piece of wire hanging out there as an antenna. Well, in fact, every metal conductor. But it, it creates a real resistance in that wire. It's the resistance caused by the loading of space. And it's what makes the radio waves when you shake the copper atoms with RF. So remember, R sub R is a very important term. And that's why I like this metaphor. I've always liked it. Push on the radiation resistance with RF current in the antenna, and you'll make radio waves, just like this finger pushing on this little piece of wire in the bowl of jello makes ripples in the bowl of jello. Same exact process in analogy. All right, here's getting to the important stuff, though. Those are just understanding points that we've gone through so far. Efficiency of an antenna versus its size. This is a very, very important concept. And if you remember nothing else but this from this lecture, remember this one. And here is the here is the rule of thumb to try to remember. See if you can remember this one. Radiation resistance, the loading of that bowl of jello on your antenna, goes, uh, I'm sorry, the conductor resistance at the top, the resistance, the ohmic, ohmic resistance in the, in the copper or the aluminum or whatever you made the antenna out of, goes down as the antenna gets smaller. Sure, well, less wire, less resistance. Okay, but it goes down directly or linearly, as we say. So a half size antenna, if you make it half size with a loading coil or something else, a half size antenna has only a half the conductor resistance. That's pretty straightforward. But now look at this jello resistance, the radiation resistance, the loading of space, the one that makes radio waves, R sub R. It goes down as the square of the size reduction. So if you make an antenna half as big, 
it has half the rate conductor resistance, but it has a quarter of the radiation resistance, meaning that the efficiency is now half as great if you make the antenna half as half as big. It's a rule of physics. It cannot be violated. Here's where it applies in a practical sense. Here's a nice big antenna on the left. That's large compared to the wavelength. That Yagi, that multiband Yagi, those elements are probably half, a, nearly a half a wavelength long. That's big in proportion to the wavelength. Therefore, there's a lot of coupling to space. It has a lot of connection to the jello. Therefore, the radiation resistance is high and the efficiency of a big antenna like that is high. So remember, any big antenna compared to its wavelength has a high radiation resistance, comparatively high. A small antenna, however, and I've taken the small to its extreme over on the right, a little screwdriver antenna on the, on the bumper of this four-wheel drive here. That is a very, very, very inefficient antenna. Why? Because suppose that's on 40 meters. He's trying to operate it on 40 meters. What fraction of a wavelength is that? 16th or something like that? It has very, very low radiation resistance, but its conductor resistance is only uh, a, a reasonable part of, of that normal resistance. So the efficiency of that antenna is low. I'll make a statement that many HF mobilers don't like to hear. If you've got a 40 meter mobile whip on the back of your car, I'll bet you good money that it's no more than 5% efficient at the best, even, it's the, even if it's the biggest, heaviest screwdriver you can buy, because the radiation resistance is infinitesimal, where the conductor resistance is still high. All right, enough said on that, enough preaching. I'll get off my soapbox here. And let's lower the frequency of a helical coil, because this is what you're probably going to want to do with this more than anything. All right, being the typical ham, I went out and started to uh, do a little experimentation, bought myself a 10 foot length of four inch PVC pipe. And I made myself a no radial, no radial vertical out of it, just like that two meter one. It's off center fed just like the two meter one. It resonated at 25 megahertz. I just wanted to see what would happen if I'd build a bigger one. I've discovered if I if I make if I rewind this as I'm in the process of doing right now, with with uh, which I've already just done with and I just finished an inch and a half gap instead of two inch gap, it went down to 21 megahertz, almost uh, you know now now down low enough for 15 meters. But what would happen? And I'm going to do this next. I'm going to wind one inch copper tape onto it, with with some gap. St probably start with one inch, but uh, that should easily take me down to 20 meters. In fact, this is what I'm going to do is develop an antenna here that with plug-in banana plug jumpers, you can quickly step outside and retune this 10 foot tall, high efficiency HF vertical that needs no radials right at ground level. You can see it's only a foot off the ground here that will tune up uh, on 20 meters, 17 meters, 15 meters, 12 meters, or 10 meters, maybe even six, by simply moving some jumpers. This should be a pretty interesting article. I should bring it out later in QST. Here's another interesting uh, version of this antenna. One of the other clubs asked me when I gave this talk, hey, can you wind that on a pool noodle? <laughs> Many of you know what pool noodles are, those plastic things that kids like to play with in swimming pools. Uh, so I bought myself a, a five foot long, three and a half inch jumbo size pool noodle. And I wound one inch tape on it with half inch spacing. And it, uh, it makes a very nice uh, loading coil. This can also be used up in your attic instead of the cardboard tube. One inch tape, half an inch gap. 
it resonated at 28 megahertz. So I got this, this pool noodle, this five foot pool noodle uh, is good for 10 meters. You want to put two of them in series and put some wire on the end of it, you can get it down lower. And you so use more than one of them in series and use it for your attic antenna. It's a, a, a great thing to use or that big cardboard too. Both of them work well, much cheaper, much easier than using a lot of expensive copper tubing to try to wind a loading coil in the attic. How do I attach to these antennas? This people ask me this one. Well, here's the, here's the answer. You take some brass washers. You don't have to use the ring terminals. I just use them because I had them already on the end of the coax and solder, solder the end of your coax after you've divided it into separate conductors to the brass washers and then just put them against the aluminum foil tape at the gap, which is the feed point, and hold it on there with a piece of uh, Gorilla tape. Works brilliantly well, and they stay on very well. Or if you're, really, if you're really enthusiastic, you can drill holes in the glass. This is that 10-inch glass planter of mine. As you can see the feed point of it uh, down near the bottom of the planter, and this, this works very well. I just turn it against the wall, and nobody sees the feed point. The ring terminals are optional and Gorilla tape is what holds the brass washers onto the uh, onto the foil tape. Now you can solder onto copper tape, but unfortunately it won't tan much strain. It's easy to tear that solder off of it. So I recommend this brass washer technique for all metal foil tapes and tennis. All right, you do need a ballot. Uh, maybe the, maybe you'd get away with the planter without a ballon because you're sort of floating in your easy chair electrically. But most of these foil tape antennas uh, definitely need some kind of a ballon. And here are four little two meter ballons that I'm very fond of, a typical uh, uh, solenoid ballon at the top on PVC or a scramble bond ballon there at the bottom held together with zip ties or a torus ballon which is the same as the scrambled ballon, except you've looped the wire back through the middle to tie it into a torus knot. Or at the bottom right there is my favorite. Uh, it's a little 3D printed form that I printed to make little ballons. This is a two meter 3D printed form. If you want the STL file for this and have a printer, just send me an email. I'll gladly send you the STL file so you can print it. I also have one of these for six meters. Uh, they make these are what you call ugly ballons. And of course you can use ferrites if you want to too, some 61 mix bead, uh, 63 mix beads uh, on the coax is fine. Sometimes you can put it right inside of the antenna. All right, lastly here, let's consider the various ways, the, the general ways you can change frequency in making a helix out of copper foil or aluminum foil tape. You've got four choices. Make the pole longer. That's obvious. That'll give you more turns. Take you down lower in frequency. Or make the pole bigger in diameter. So that cardboard tube is bigger than the pool noodle. So it has more inductance. And so these are the these are two ways. And these are the preferable ways. That's why I have them green. Now you can make the coil uh, have go lower in frequency by changing the width of the tape. Uh, that's also an acceptable way, but as you do, you're going to increase the conductor resistance. So uh, that's this, this one reduces, it reduces the efficiency some. Tape spacing is also something you can use. Now, of course, as you get too close, you're gonna get as adjacent turn skin effect loss. So you gotta watch these last two. You can use them. They're perfectly usable methods, but just be aware that you're gonna give up some efficiency by using tape width and tape spacing to make lower frequency. Whereas pole length or, uh, or coil length, antenna length and antenna diameter are, will keep the efficiency high. So finally here to conclude, I wanna give a little testimonial though for going ahead and building these in lower efficiency models to get them as low as in frequency as you can. My little uh, my little one inch tape 
uh, close spaced copper foil 10 inch uh, 10 foot PVC piece of pipe. It's not going to be top efficiency, but it's still going to be 80 90% efficient. So don't uh, don't worry about making the tape a little narrower or the spacing a little narrower. It'll go down some, but not tremendously. And besides, is it a grievous mistake to make to use narrower tape and or less turn spacing? This is an important question to ask. How bad of an of a mistake is it? It's not that bad, frankly. It yes, you're going to give up some efficiency, but you're still going to have a lot of good results making small foil antennas if you make the turns close together and you make the tape narrow. Why do I say this? Have any of you ever used one of these antennas? Anybody ever talked on a handy talkie with a rubber ducky on it? Which one of you is going to tell me that a rubber ducky is an efficient antenna? Why most hams called rubber duckies better than a du little better than a dummy load, and that they are. They're terribly inefficient antennas for some of the very reasons I'm talking about here today. Also, any of you ever used one of those items on the left? That's a 20 meter and a 40 meter Hustler loading coil, standard loading coils. Any of you ever put one of those on your on your car on a, with, a, with a 40 meter or 20 meter mobile whip? Any of you ever made any contacts that way? Why, of course you have lots of them. So just because an antenna is not very efficient, and believe me, those Hustler loading coils are not efficient. The best 40 meter antenna that you can get on a car is no better than about 5% efficient due to this loading coil. And even if it's a great big Hustler band spanner or great big, great big screwdriver antenna, it's still low in efficiency. But do you ever make contacts with them? Why, of course you do just as you make contacts with the HD, probably many every week. So let me put in at least a testimonial here for, let's push these foil antennas down in frequency. See how low we can get them. And uh, that's why I'm working on that 10 foot tall piece of PVC with one inch copper tape spaced close together. That's gonna be a killer antenna, much better than a lot of the compromises people make. So if you ever build one of these antennas out of copper foil, uh, send me pictures. I love to get pictures of antennas and testimonials of people who have done it. And in particular, I'm hoping that maybe some of you will think of a new way to use this copper foil tape to make antennas. Do send me photos and details because I am writing a new Amazon Kindle ebook, which should be out pretty soon. I'd hope to get it out before the before I run up to speak at a conference here at, at Pacificon in San Francisco. In fact, I'm leaving for that conference tomorrow. But I hope, was hoping this foil tape antenna book would be done by then. But if you've got a, any ideas on how to use foil tape, uh, <coughs> maybe, maybe a, one of the ones I want to try is to try making a foil tape uh, uh, magnetic loop instead of with expensive heavy copper tubing or aluminum tubing to use foil on PVC and make one that's efficient, just as efficient as that expensive heavy copper one that you spent a lot of money building. Okay, so guys, you can have a lot of fun with foil tape antennas. I put this in here because it's reminiscent of the Big Bang Theory program, which some of you uh, no, doubt, no doubt have watched where Sheldon there uh, put on his, uh, his uh, little programs, which he called Fun with Flags. I call this Fun with Foil Antennas. And here's my little doggie. No, her call sign is not D0GGY. She doesn't have a call sign, but uh, I like to pretend she does. And there's my uh, email address if you want to get to me there. And there's a QR code to, uh, to get to me if you want to welcome emails, or you can go to my website, w6nbc.com, where I have a lot of other topics I'm willing to talk on. And that's it, guys.
Okay, John, thank you. Well, very interesting. Uh, great presentation, interesting subject. And uh, I made a number of notes of things I would like to check out a little more here. So thank you very much for talking about the foil antennas. Now, does anybody have any uh, questions for John? We'll have a very brief question and answer session here. I have uh, one question. I've got one too. Okay, Gary, go ahead. Um, wonderful presentation, thank you very much. I'm just wondering mechanically, seeing in some of your, in the construction process, in some of your pictures, um, how do you wrap this foil on PVC, et cetera, and keep that exact wonderful spacing I'm seeing in your pictures. How do you, how do you go about wrapping it so well? Very good question. And one that I deal with in, in separate material. Uh, I do have a separate presentation on, on actually building one of those little two meter ones where I show the process, but it's pretty straightforward simpler than you thought. It took me a while to brain this one out, but I finally did. Just take yourself some heavy, some lightweight, but fairly thick cardboard and cut yourself some strips of it on a paper cutter, accurately cut them and tape them together in a long strip. Uh, and, you, and the width of it should be the width of the tape and the, and the plus the width you want to put the tape apart. Then you take that cardboard strip and you wrap it helically around the tube and use it as a marking guide with a Sharpie pen, go right along the edge of the copper of the, of, of the paper tape. The best source for this material is not so much cardboard, but buy yourself some plastic notebook dividers. This is what I like to use and cut them into nice plastic strips, tape them together with a nice piece of, of, uh, of, of, uh, Gorilla tape on the back. Don't put it on the on the on the inside, and then just wrap that around. And I can go right down that tube, just moving it down the down one turn at a time, and put a nice mark on it. And the tape goes right on. It wrinkles a little, and you have to juggle it, but it goes on pretty easily. Okay, thank you, John. Fred. Uh, John, thanks for the presentation. Uh, very interesting. I, I had done a little exploration for low band antennas using not foil tape, but rather just winding helix on a PVC pipe. Sure. And trying to, uh, to, to make a long vertical antenna that way. And I was, I was disappointed when I started looking because I couldn't really find any antenna modeling uh, for, for helical wound antennas. And I was wondering if you developed anything either for wire or for your, your copper tape that uh, you found works uh, both on the computer and then in real life uh, with a good comparison. Okay. Uh, I, did mention, I did mention that briefly in the talk, but maybe we can expand on it a little bit here. I have found, and actually it was Roy Llewellyn who, who did the front end for, for Easy Neck, uh, who told me to do this. And he's, he's right. And I've checked it out by comparing some real antennas with the models, the easy neck models that I've done. There's two ways to model a helix. One is, one is to make the, uh, well, e easy neck itself, most of these neck programs will, will build and model helixes. I, I do uh, coil helixes in them all the time. But if you're going to model foil tape, you've got to, you've got to use the equivalent uh, conductor to the foil tape. And as I've said, it's basically equivalent to its circumference in width. So if you've got a one inch wide piece of tape, it's basically equivalent to a piece of three eighths inch tubing. And if you just model your you model your helix in the three eighths inch tubing uh, in Easy Neck, which makes helixes brilliantly. If you go into the wires portion of of Easy Neck, you can make helices of any any width and spacing you like. Uh, I do it all the time. The other way, of course, in the modeling uh, for foil, is you can make what's called a wireframe. You know, familiar with a wireframe? Wireframe is a grid work of wires that are smaller together or closer together than a 
tenth of a wavelength. And just like in a in a mesh in a mesh parabolic dish, the RF doesn't pay any attention to the holes as long as the holes are smaller than a tenth of a wavelength. So I I tend to like and I find it models more closely if I will actually make myself uh, a mesh helix uh, in the modeling program. And it takes a little work to do them. And I've gotten pretty good at making mesh helices, but uh, they model very close, very, very close. Uh, like all of those modeling programs, the impedance is not terribly close, but they certainly get you in the ballpark. Thank you. Oops. Any other questions? Uh, I've got a question. Hey, Michael. Uh, John, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, I've uh, learned a lot the second time around here. A uh, question about, uh, can you tell us a little bit about polarization and then also uh, what affects uh, some of these uh, uh, foil uh, helical uh, antennas that the HF frequencies would have based upon the height above the ground? Okay, that's a, uh, that's a, a full lecture that you're asking for, but we see if we can cover some of it. <laughs> First of all, all helices, all helically wound antennas have both right-handed and left-hand circular polarization. It's present in them by nature. But if you make them long and tall, one of them dominates. And that's what happens with the, with the tall helix. If you, make, if you make one that's square, same height as same width, it's going to pretty much be an omniradiator but it will be circularly polarized, both right-handed and left-handed at the same time. You might find that difficult to believe, but it's true. When you model it in easy neck, you can see the, the two polarizations. So I generally find these helices work best if they have a, if they have a width to height ratio of at least three to one. I push the, I push the daylights out of it with my little, with my little planter antenna but it works fine. It's just something that sits on a bookshelf and looks pretty. Uh, <laughs> it's, I, wasn't, I wasn't aiming for high efficiency. So, uh, but basically you make a helix vertical and vertical and it will be largely look like a vertical. Make it this way, it'll look largely like a, a horizontal. And, uh, and it behaves, it behaves a lot like any vertical or horizontal the same general rules as a standard straight vertical or horizontal. Okay, thank you, John. Oh, one quick one before I go away. I fooled myself years ago with these helices. I was making them out of copper tubing back then. Uh, I fooled myself in thinking, well, if I can make a nice little small antenna with a, into a helix, you know, because a short helix will resonate the same as a long as a long straight piece of wire. So if I could make it smaller, I've got a I've got a smaller yet efficient antenna. If I make the conductors big, and I was making it on a nice aluminum tubing. Uh, once I got done, I thought, well, hey, why don't I make a Yagi out of this? Why don't I make three coils, three helices, and and do, do what Yegi and Yuda did and phase them together or make the size a little different. The interesting thing is, is that parasitic antennas only, only couple parasitically if they're largely straight. Coils will not parasitically couple. The, the, the fields are going <laughs> in all directions. <laughs> And uh, Bill, did you have a question? JV, you're, you're muted, Bill. Uh, there, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, you said you had books on Amazon, John? Yes, okay. yeah, go to Amazon. Oh, just one right now, I'll have two here pretty soon. But, uh, but the first one was, is uh, slot antennas for ham radio. So the slot antenna has been quite a mystery in the ham community. Hams know about them, but they've never done anything practically with them. 
and there's a good reason for it, of course, which I cover in the book. But I decided some time ago to try to make slot antennas practical for ham radio. And that's what this book is about. A little 495 book, you're not going to break the bank to buy it. It's available on Amazon.com. Just go to Amazon.com and put in slot antennas for ham radio, and it'll come right up. And you can you can order it right there. And what will the title of your uh, next book be then? I don't know exactly. I haven't created the title yet for it, but it's definitely going to be on on. It'll probably be something as 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 pedestrian as uh, foil antennas for ham radio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll. Uh, yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, foil antennas have a lot of potential. Only started to scratch them. I'm really looking forward to trying a. A, a compact or a magnetic loop. Uh, I've made several, I like that antenna, but they're usually heavy and expensive. And uh, uh, the idea of using copper, copper foil tape, not wound as a helix, but just covering PVC uh, strikes me as a very good way because all the current's running on the surface. It's not running on the inside of that, of that heavy copper pipe. <laughs> so, uh, Can can you uh, like briefly explain how that that tuning uh, part inside your your cardboard coil antenna in your attic? How that tuning part works? Have you ever have you ever built a a, a a magnetic loop? No. Okay. Well, if you look at magnetic loop articles, and there are plenty of them, it's one of the most popular art antennas on Pinterest. If you go to Pinterest, you know the and then look up and look at put ham radio into Pinterest or even on you, YouTube and put in the most po two most popular antennas. You can probably you can name one of them, I'm sure. It's that two meter copper pipe J pole. There are a thousand copper pipe J poles <laughs> on YouTube, and there are an equal number of magnetic loop antennas on Pinterest or or YouTube. And if you go on there and look, and you, you'll see the you'll see the compact loop or the as I like to call them, because no antenna is just magnetic. All antennas are a electromagnetic. It's as much of electric loop as it is a, a magnetic loop. It just has an intense magnetic field in the middle. But anyway, you look at one of those 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 uh, compact loops or or uh, magnetic loops, and uh, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, oh, yeah, I know. You were asking about the coupling coil. Uh, one of the easiest ways to couple to one of those magnetic loops is with a secondary coil, a smaller secondary coil, usually put down near the high current uh, end of the of the compact transmitting loop or the or the or the magnetic loop, which is the middle of the bottom. There's the tuning capacitor at the top, and then the feed point is at the bottom. You can, of course, tap it, and you, of course, you, you can use a, a gamma match. There's a lot of ways to match a, a, a magnetic loop. But one of the easiest ways is just to wind yourself a small coil. Usually, it's about a fifth the, a fifth the diameter, fifth the circumference. And you'll find that you can put it down there right near the current point and squash it or make it larger, and you can tune that thing right to one to one SWR, and huh. that's what I and that's what I did in that in that antenna loading in that attic coil. It's got a secondary loop inside the big one that rotates. The advantage mm -hmm. there is uh, you make it you make it till it's over coupled, and then you just turn it until it decouples, and you'll hit one to one just like that. Is it uh, is that pretty flat that antenna or is it is it I mean broadbanded? <laughs> Broadbanding is just a function of the of the total size of any antenna. So you got a half size antenna, it's sharper. There's no way, not much way to get to get away from it. It's efficient, but it's but any small antenna is narrow in bandwidth. You got to okay. deal with. That's why that antenna is you're going to have to tune it. <laughs> okay. Thank you.
Okay, very good. Let's hold the questions right there. And uh, John, if you are, you're welcome to stick around through our business meeting. And I'm sure we're going to have more questions after the meeting. And uh, but let's let's hold the uh, questions right there.